<clears throat> so uh, seven four is dealing with uh, Riemann's integral, the fundamental theorem of calculus, and the definitive integral. You guys are going to actually be able to find the exact area underneath the curve. This is when there are bounds with your integral symbol. And this is essentially representing the area underneath uh, a particular curve. We're going to continue to do this some more on Thursday as well. We talk about um, like looking at it graphically, looking at um, area in between two curves, area in between the curve and the y-axis, and, and other things. Okay, so this first little bit, this first little bit I'm going to take you through is what I've is what I have determined that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on going over because I feel like the bulk of what you guys really need to know is after this, but this is kind of like where it all started and where the concept came from, okay? So let's consider this function. So again, take notes as you need to, but this is, I'm leading up to something, okay? Let's consider the function f of x equals x squared, okay? And let's say we want to estimate the area enclosed by the actual function x squared, the x-axis, and the vertical line y equals 1. Okay, and that's what's represented by that shaded area that you guys see. Okay, now let's say if we were to divide up this interval from zero to one into four strips, okay, each of these strips would be of equal width of one fourth unit, as you can see in this picture. Well, by doing that, we obtain four sub intervals of equal width. We are able to estimate the area underneath the curve by creating these different four sub intervals okay so before the whole concept of the fundamental theorem of calculus came about this is how they estimated how to find area in between the curve and the x-axis okay one of the ways they did it was they created different rectangles within each of these sub intervals okay and these here, these that you guys see in this picture, are considered the lower rectangles because each of the points that uh, the rectangle touches the curve are technically underneath the graph. So these were called the lower rectangles. And what they did was essentially found the area of each rectangle, added them up, and that was basically the lower bound of what the potential area could be underneath the curve. Okay, so they took the width, which was one fourth, remember each rectangle, so there's a rectangle here, a rectangle here, there's one here, and then there's one here. They took each of the areas, length times width, multiplied them and added them up. So one fourth times zero, that represents this one that essentially does not exist. Then one fourth times F of one fourth. So basically length or width times length, and you get this small part right here, by plugging one fourth into the function, then one fourth times one half, one fourth times three fourths, and then this was the area essentially of all those rectangles. This is how they basically like low balled what the area was underneath the curve from zero to one. Then they did the exact same thing except using upper rectangles. So now it's where the endpoints of the rectangles are above, and they did the same thing. They took the area of each of the rectangles, added it up, and then they got the upper limit. Okay, so you had the lower limit and you had the upper limit, which basically said that the area between the, the rec, um, area between the curve and the x-axis had to fall in between, what was it, 0. 0.2219 2, and then 0. 0.469. Okay. Then they were like, okay, well, if we're if we're doing this, we're saying okay, that the area between the curve and the x-axis has to fall in between these two values, we only use four rectangles. So we increase the number of rectangles, we're slowly starting to decrease that space that's lying in between the curve and the rectangles, right? Because look at here, look at this one. You see all that extra space that's right there? If you create more rectangles, you essentially start to decrease that space between zero and one, okay? So, Let's say you have eight rectangles. Oh now the area lies in between this value of 0.273 and this value of 0.398. So we're getting smaller. We're slowly starting to converge to a particular value. What does converge mean? 
the approach of value, okay? So we're gonna slowly start, and the more rectangles we have, the, um, the more we start to decrease that space, and we're getting closer and closer to the number that would actually be the so area underneath the curve. The so once, like, the more you increase. The more you increase, the smaller it gets. Oh, mm -hmm. And so again, the more rectangles you have, um, the closer you get to this particular value. So with four rectangles, this was my lower limit, this is my upper limit, this is about the average. Eight rectangles, lower limit, upper limit, the average. But as you continue to increase your number of rectangles, you see that the average or the interval starts to decrease and the average starts to converge to a particular value, which is what? One third. One third. So the area underneath the curve, the most exact area underneath the curve between zero and one, of that function x squared was one third. That's how they started this out, right? That's how they started this whole idea of trying to find the area in between the curve. But if you but if you realize x squared only increases from zero to one, what if there was a term, right? What if it went like this instead from zero to one? You wouldn't be able to use, rectangles weren't as accurate. So then they came up with the trapezoidal rule and they had a, had a formula for that. And then they continue to find all these other rules until someone said, you know what? No, I have a better mm -hmm. idea. And then this is where said, you are gonna start taking your notes of how to find the area underneath the curve. Does this unify like all of the different like, rules? Mm -hmm. Yes, it unifies everything. And it gives you the, the most exact way to find the area underneath the curve. This is when Riemann's integral came about the, the one with the bounds, okay? The four function, whether it was increasing the entire time or it increased and decreased, it didn't matter, okay? But, but <laughs> to find the area underneath your curve from a lower bound to an upper bound, it is written in this blue purplish box. That's how it's written. It's called the definite integral. It is read the integral of f of x from a to b with respect to x. It allows you to find the area underneath your curve between your curve and your x-axis. Yeah, yes, yeah. so it, it, it is gonna have to go from A to B. So B is always gonna be your, your larger x value and A is always gonna be your smaller. If it's, let's say like it was written and it was backwards, there is actually a rule to make sure that it's right. The B should always be your larger x value and A should be your low, the smallest x value. All right. So <laughs> Riemann's integral, or the definite integral, again, it allows us to find the area underneath the curve. So for example, we're going to do this using, I don't know why that random line is there. Oh, I know what now. Um, we're going to do this using a few different methods, OK? The first here is we're going to graph each of these functions, and we're going to find the area underneath the curve and the x-axis, OK? So we have the integral from zero to two of two x plus one dx, okay? First off, two x plus one looks like a what? Oh, it looks like a line. That's why that line was there. I'm wrong. Oh, that line there. Okay? It is a line. And quick review, where is it uh, with the y-intercept? It's one, and then it's the slope is? Up to, over one. up to over one, up to over one, up to over one. Or I could go down to, which way? Left, left. left one. And so then I'll have my line. Now, because I want to find the area underneath the curve from zero to two, I'm going to go from zero to two. And this is what I want to find here. Now, if you notice, this forms a shape. What shape is that? Ooh. Mostly, it's actually a quadrilateral. It is a quadrilateral. Which, which quadrilateral is it? Maybe you can't see because it was so small. Yeah, like the little little piece of the. Yeah. Like this stuff. Yeah, the tip. So what kind so what kind of quadrilateral is this? It's a trapezoid. So from zero to two, it actually forms a trapezoid. 
So if it does form a geometric shape that you guys should know the area formula for, you can always do the area of that respective shape. Who remembers the formula for the area of a trapezoid? Base one. What you say? Over two times the height. Okay, so what would be the two bases? What would be the length of my two bases here? One and five. So that's going to be one plus five. I want to divide that by two. And then what's going to be the height? Two. So then what is going to be the area of this trapezoid, aka the area underneath the curve? It's going to be six. So the integral from zero to two of two x plus one dx is equal to six because it's representative of that geometric shape that it formed underneath the curve. What? The area underneath the curve or the definite integral from zero to two, this shaded region right here is gonna be equal to six because it's equivalent to the area of the trapezoid that was formed from those two yeah. bounds. I had a bur this I had that burning question of how they did the curve for so long. Well, there we go. Now let's look at this one. This one might be a little bit harder to recognize off gate. Maybe, maybe not. But of course you could always plug in values. Pretend like we don't have our calculator here. I don't. Okay. <laughs> but I know my bounds are from zero to one. So if I plug zero into the function, what's my output? One. 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 And I'll plug my upper bound in of one. What would that give me? It gave me zero. But is this going to be a straight line? No. No, it's going to be a like a little, like a little yeah. curve. So between zero and one, what have we formed? A little semicircle. It's it's a well not not a not a full semicircle, but a, a quarter. A quarter of a circle. So if I wanted to find the area underneath my curve or the area between oh, so you just do one circle. Which is one equals pi r squared. Pi r squared. Very good. What is the radius here? One. One. So this would be nothing but one fourth times pi one squared, or in other words, pi over four. And that would be what the definite integral would be from zero to one of the square root of one minus x squared. Yeah, why are you talking about like, it's only, it's uh, like isn't that just basically a fourth degree triangle? Yep, that's a fourth dimension. Pretty much. All right. So far, so good. Wait, so but it's so one one. So if it is that simple, we don't need to do anything with the derivatives. Not the way integration. You just have to recognize that the integral would represent to find the area from zero to one underneath that curve. So if we know what it would look like and we know how to find that area, we find that area. No, and nothing else. Correct. Of course, you know, of course, not not every not every area underneath the curve is going to form a geometric shape, but if it does, you can use that. Okay. okay. Especially if you, you know, if it's a non-calculator question and happens to form that particular type of shape. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over this. If I have time, we'll come back to it, but it, it's similar. Okay, it's similar. Are you going to do what happens when it doesn't form a geometric shape? Of course. Hopefully. Of course. Okay. Yeah. But, <laughs> but before we get to when it doesn't form a geometric shape, let's look at these first, because this concept can also be applied, let's say, if we're not even given the function at all, like an equation at all, right? We're just essentially told what the respective areas are underneath certain pieces of. Okay, so I'll give you guys a second to write this down and then we'll go over it. So for a positive function f of x, we know two given areas. Because remember, anytime we see the integral with bounds, it's representing area underneath a particular function 
from one bound to the upper bound, okay? From the lower bound to the upper bound. So the integral from two to five of a function is equal to 10. And then the integral from five to nine of a function is equal to 12. So you're asked to find these other two integrals from five to five of a function and from two to nine of a function, okay? And so how I've always done this is like, so essentially what you're saying is that you have some random function, okay? Some random function that from two to five underneath the curve, that area, is 10. And then from five to nine under that area is 12. So if I wanted to find the integral from five to five of the function, well, if I'm going from five to five, am I covering any space? So what would be the area underneath the curve? Zero. Wow. But if I wanted to find the integral from two to nine, what would I do? I would add them. Because I have the area from two to five and from five to nine, which make a total of 22. Okay. Okay. I'm ready for her to say five. <laughs> All right. I'm ready. So far so good? I'm ready to have reality shattered. Trying to baby step the end. Okay. Oh, Let's take a look at this one. If the integral from one to three of a function is two, and the integral from one to six of a function is negative three, then what's the integral from three to six of the function? Mm -hmm. So anytime you have a negative, okay, that's represented in an integral, that means that that respective area is below the x-axis, okay? So essentially, if I'm going from one to three, my function is above the x-axis because it's a positive two. But then from one to six, it's a negative three. So from one to six, I'm at a negative three. That means at some point, this curve had to dip below the x-axis, okay, in order to get this. So I know that from here to here, my area is two. And then I know from one to six, my area is negative three. So you have to determine what is it from three to six. Well, the easiest way to do that is just to, hmm, so essentially subtract. So what is the integral from three to six of the function? What is it? Negative five, because again, this area of two plus this unknown area needs to equal negative three. So then it would just be negative five. So you can even do it without functions. Okay, you can find respective areas. Coming up. With functions, it's coming up. The ones that don't form geometric shapes. So if, if that negative three was like negative five, it, was, it would be a, like where no 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 this this these values represent areas not actual like positions along your oh. x-axis now these properties um well, well, the reason why it makes sense, the last uh, two that we were able to do is because these are some respective properties that go along with it, okay? Um, go along with definite integrals. Some of them you have seen before because we did them with indefinite integrals, such as this third one that basically says that if I'm trying to find, um, well, actually, no, no, I'm not. The first the, fir the first one, the first one is one that we did with um, indefinite integrals, the constant multiple rule, where if you have a constant in front of a function, you can always just pull it out, do the antiderivative of the function, and then multiply. Um, the addition one, number four, is that if you have like a, a three-term polynomial, you take the antiderivative of each 
term works the same way with the um, definite integral. Of course, the zero integral, that if the bounds are the exact same, the area underneath the curve is going to be zero. Uh, going backwards is a little bit. Number two is the negation one. Let's say that your bounds were backwards. You can turn them correctly by just negating the integral. So let's say that it said from two to negative one of your function, it, it needs to be your lower bound on the bottom and your smaller bound on the bottom and your largest bound at the top. So you can make it right by negating the actual integral and then proceeding that forward, okay? And then of course the decomposition one, which is the one that you guys did on that last slide, the um, area underneath the curve from one bound to another bound plus from that bound to a new one is the full function. So you can use these different properties um, with the definite integral. Um, when you're not given a function, like we're going to do it on, on like maybe a couple more examples. And then of course, when we actually get to ones where we're given a function and they do not model geometric shapes. So let's take a look at this one. Suppose the integral from negative one to one of f of x dx is equal to negative four. We're going to determine the value of the integral from one to negative one of f of x dx and the integral from negative one to one of two f of x dx. Based off of what we're given, the integral from negative one to one of f of x dx is equal to negative four. We can see that A looks the exact same, except what do you notice? The negation. It's gonna involve the negation one because the bounds are flipped. So we can always turn them back right by negating the integral. Then all we need to do is just replace that integral from negative one to one of f of x dx with what we were giving from the from jump. So the integral from one to negative one of our function is actually going to be equal to negative four. Positive four. Positive four. Yep. Sorry. So that is a negative four. And again, we get that from being a negative negative four. That's how we get that. What about for B? Oh, uh, well, multiply the whole thing by two. Yeah, just move the two out to the front. Move the two out to the front. And again, we have the original integral given to us. So we can replace that with a negative four. And our answer is going to be negative eight. Okay. Okay. Waiting for the pain. Where is it? No, you don't have to. Okay. So this is how we find exact areas underneath the curve without a function. We've done it using uh, geometric shapes. I showed you in general how it was originally estimated, but the real truth that it all comes down to the part that you definitely need to know, definitely need to know how to do is the fundamental theorem of calculus, which allows you to take any function and find the area underneath the curve from one bound to another. Right. So the fundamental theorem of calculus basically says the integral from A to B of a function is equal to the antiderivative evaluated at B minus the antiderivative evaluated at A. So you find the antiderivative. So remember capital F is the antiderivative of lowercase f. You plug in your upper bound, you plug in your lower bound, and then you subtract it. This is what allows us to calculate the area underneath the curve before we were only able to approximate using the rectangular method, the trapezoidal method, or those more complicated, more confusing functions. Okay, so from before, when I showed you quickly, briefly, how we were able to approximate using the rectangular method of how to find the area underneath the curve of x squared from zero to one, and how we you know, found the lower limit, upper limit, and then we took the average, increased the number of rectangles, so on and so forth. You can use the fundamental theorem of calculus here to actually find the exact value, which we can already know to be one third. But we set up the integral using our bounds to make this a definite integral, 
No plus C when you have bounds. There's no plus C when you have bounds. So again, you take the antiderivative of x squared. What's the antiderivative of x squared? One third, oh, one third x to the third. Remember, we add one to the exponent, and then we do one over the, the new exponent as a coefficient. We're going to evaluate that from zero to one. So the fundamental theorem of calculus says we plug in the upper bound, which is one, and we subtract it from when we plug in the lower bound, which is zero. Well, obviously, zero to the third power times one third is zero, and one to the third power is just one. So my answer here is one third. And that's exactly what we were able to approximate by increasing the number of rectangles from the very beginning of this video. Okay, that's why I said before, before the fundamental theorem of calculus was ever created, that's how they were able to approximate the area underneath the curve by continuing to increase the number of rectangles that fit to shorten that space between the rectangle and the curve. Like the code, like the code, like the, like the subintervals. Like. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's still coded. Like you just have to type it in a particular way. All right, let's take a look at these, okay? We're going the integral from one to two of x to the third minus four x plus five dx. So remember, you take the antiderivative, you plug in the upper bound, and you subtract it from when you plug in the lower bound. So first, let's start with the antiderivative. What's the antiderivative of x to the third? Minus 2x squared plus 5x. Now, normally this was an indefinite integral, we would put our plus C and be done, but because we have bounds, that actually means we are looking for the area underneath the curve. So that means I'm gonna plug in which bound first? Whichever one you want. No, no. Well, I mean, wait, hold up. Just plug in upper bound. You plug in your oh. upper bound first. Always plug in your upper bound first. Okay. And then you subtract it from when you plug in your lower bound. Now be careful when you subtract. You're subtracting the entire number when you plug in the lower bound. So make sure you either distribute that negative over or find that value first and then subtract whatever that value is, okay? Two to the fourth is? Divided by four? Uh, what's two squared uh, times two? Eight. Five times two? Yeah. So this becomes over here, one fourth minus two plus five. And then we continue just to do our simple, simple algebra. All right, let's do this one. Let's do this one together. What's the antiderivative of 2x? 2 over 3x squared. I mean, yep. Yeah. No, no. Wait. It's, oh, sorry. X squared? X squared. It's x squared. And then what about that 3 over x squared? Uh, bring up 3x. I need to bring up that x squared and then make it a. And now apply the rule. So negative three over x. Very good, negative three over x. I'm gonna evaluate that from one to four. Which bound goes in first? Uh, four. Four, plug in the upper bound first. Then I subtract it from when I plug in the lower bound. Make sure you include parentheses or another set of brackets around that entire f of a part where you plug in the lower bound. So this becomes 16 minus 3 fourths, 1 minus 3, which is a negative 2.
So what is that? Saying all right. Yep. Uh, What's that value? So then this will equal 69 over 4. That would represent, both of these would represent the area that's underneath the curve. So for this one, I pulled the graph from the calculator. This goes from 1 to 2. We found this area right here. That's 11 fourths. Over here, we're going from 1 to 4. We found this area. If I believe the calculator knows how to do this as well. I'm going to show you how to do this in your calculator. Pull out your calculator. I know, right? Now, of course, these, both of these are fair game for a calculator, it's a non calculator section because it's a can be done, it's simple algebra, okay? But for your more complicated ones, you want to use your calculator. And I'm going to show you how to do that using your calculator, okay? Now, of course, this is going to be for your more complicated ones. But of course, you can always check your work, like your homework, um, on the easy ones. Okay. All right, where is it? All right, there it is. So here we go. Everybody ready? No. So here we go. Here we go. You can do again. Use your calculator for the more complicated ones, and of course, for the ones that are they say calculator only. What you do, you go to math. You go to option nine that says FNINT. Now, if you have the most updated type of calculator, it'll pop up literally a blank integral that all you have to do is type it in and fill it in. Okay. So for the one uh, for A, I'm going from one to two. Then I just type in my function x to the third minus 4x plus 5. And then, of course, you can't forget the ds because this is a proper Riemann integral. And we get a 2.75, which when I convert it back into a fraction, pressing math, frac, I get 11 over 4. What a beautiful. All right. So you can use this to check your answers on your homework if it's a non calculator. But of course, you also need to know how to do this by hand. You can also do it using the graphing feature of your calculator, which I'll do with B. B can be done the same way we just did A, but I'm going to show you other features of your calculator. Go to your Y equals. Type in this function, 2x plus 3 over x squared. OK? Then go zoom 6 to take you back to a standard window. There's your function. Right, the same, this is the same one I, I pulled the screenshot from. Now, I can do, I can also find the area underneath the curve using the um, feature of the graph. If you press the second button, then the trace button, you see option seven has the integral. If you go to option seven, it'll ask you for a lower limit. My lower limit was one, so I'm going to click one and then enter. Then it's going to ask me for my upper limit. My upper limit was four. So I'm going to click four and then enter. And what it does, it defines yes. the area underneath the curve between the curve and the x axis. 17.25 is what 69 over four is. Do it one more time. Mm -hmm. I need to see this one more time. So you type your function into y equals. And of course, you graph it. Then you go to second trace. Okay, that's where all those features were that we used before. We're going to go to option seven. That's going to help us find the area underneath the curve. It's going to say lower limit. So you got to type in the lower limit, which was one, and then enter. Upper limit, which was four, enter. And then it, it does the coloring underneath and it gives you your answer. Oh, so now that you know how to do it by hand, as well as using your calculator, what I want you guys to do is I want you to take the next five minutes and I want you to do these three problems by hand. Once you've done all three problems, I want you to use the calculator to check to see if you're right. So I'm giving you five minutes to do that. 
So you guys should be able to do this by hand and have your calculator check you, okay? Um, so you should have had 15 over four for the first one, negative one eighth for the second one, 11 over 108. Okay, all right. I'm not gonna go over these. Hopefully you guys, are, I mean, just some of the more simpler ones, okay? Let's get into something that are a little bit more involved. I would say these next two are at like the medium level. And then the last, the last three uh, slides will take you up a little, a little bit higher, okay? Um, the graph of y equals negative x squared plus x plus six is shown alongside. Find the coordinates a and b, and then hence find the shaded area. If you notice, a and b represent what specifically? It represents the roots, the zeros, okay? And so if I find those, they also represent what in context of the shaded region? The bounds. So by us finding the coordinates of A and B, we're also going to be able to find the bounds that we'll be able to take the inside derivative of to find the area of the shaded region. So great time to review. Let's try to find the coordinates of A and B, aka the zeros, the roots. I'm going to need to what? Huh? Yeah. Uh, so so sounds like y'all trying to factor. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, I hate working with the negative in the front. Can I factor it out instead? Yeah, I'll factor out a negative. If I factor out a negative instead, then I don't have to worry about doing California. Okay. So what two numbers multiply to give me negative six that add together to give me a negative one? Well, Positive two and negative three. Positive two. Negative three. But when you solve, you can negative one zero. Technically, you have negative one equal and zero. Oh, yeah, sorry. X plus two equal and zero. Yeah. And X minus three equal yeah. zero. So I have x is equal to negative two, x is equal to three. This negative won't have any effect there. It just lets us know that it does open down because it was negative. So what are the coordinates of A? And B is? That also lets us know that to find the area of our shaded region, I'm gonna go from negative two to positive three of this function, negative x squared plus x plus six dx. What's the antiderivative of negative x squared? Negative one third, x to the third. What about the antiderivative of x? One half. Plus 6x. I'm evaluating that from negative 2 to positive 3, which bound goes in first. So it's going to be 3. Then I'm going to subtract when I plug in that lower bound. I need to be careful because not only does my lower bound have a negative, but I'm also dealing with the fact I have to subtract. I can either distribute or work out the problem before I distribute. Me personally, I'm going to work out each side. Three to the third power is 27. 27 divided by three is nine. So it's going to be a negative nine. Then I'm going to have nine over two. Then I have a positive 18. That's going to get subtracted from four, negative four thirds. Oh, this is a cube. Never mind. Positive eight thirds. Then plus two minus twelve. Ah, space nine plus nine halves minus eight thirds. 
Mass space. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh. Um, oh, I for me, I had distributed yeah. it over you. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I distributed over uh here when I combined the nine and the negative ten together. From one twenty five over six. Of course, we can always double check that with our calculator. Look at this one. This is a good one. Reason why it's a good one. It's because, yeah, because we need an ounce. And you have to find the exact value of A. But as we can see from our picture, it uh, that shaded area underneath the curve of the x-axis is 6a. So we know what the area should equal. We know what the function is. We just don't know the bounds yet. Fine. Okay. So how would I set up this integral to represent this particular situation? Mm -hmm. what's, what's my function? Six a. So to work this out, we essentially just need to do the antiderivative, plug in our bounds, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Antiderivative of x squared. And for two, I'm going to plug in my bounds, being very careful. Remember, all of this is equal to 6a. So when I plug in my upper bound, that's going to give me one third a to the third plus 2a minus a negative one third a to the third minus 2a. Does everybody see where I got the negative one third a to the third minus two a from? Yep. Plugged in the negative a, negative a to the third power is a negative a to the third. Get multiplied for that positive one third, and that's how we get that. If I distribute over my negative and combine like terms, that's going to give me two thirds a to the third plus four a is equal to six a. Okay. Is this still a non calculator one? What can I do from here? Subtract 4a. Subtract 4a? No, I just, I'm just, well, I'll figure out on one side. Yeah. Let's subtract the 6a. Let's subtract the 6a. Bring all to one side. Yeah, Sounds like you're trying to make this into a quadratic. Yes, I am. But you can't stop me. I'm not, listen, I'm not stopping. I'm good. Yeah. I'm not stopping. Could I factor this? You could, you could. How so? You could factor out any, right? And a fraction within the parentheses, too. We all have. That's okay. You can do it, yeah. Yeah, because like I said, the factor is equal to zero, right? A is equal to zero, which A cannot be correct. Okay? Is it, it, does, it doesn't work out because it has to be from negative A to positive A. It has to actually be some physical value. So it must occur here. So to solve this, I'm going to add over two. Then what? Multiply two by three. Multiply two by three over two. So then that's going to give me three. A is equal to the square root of three. Uh, well, essentially, yeah, it would be plus or minus, but it's asking for the value of A, 
since I know I have a negative A and a positive A, I know that A is going to be essentially the square root of three because when I plug it in, it's going to be negative and positive. Wow. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Not too bad, right? Fundamental standard of calculus. How do you feel about it? We do got one more slide. Because if you think about it, every single one of these functions have been Basically. in polynomial. You can't forget about trig. You also can't forget about uh, exponentials. Y'all can't forget about u substitution or integration by parts. Oh my God. What I spent, you know, before Christmas break going over with integration. Why? Because you needed them to be able to do any of these things. Yeah. So let's take a look. Okay. We're going to finish these off. Take, like I said, taking it up a little bit. Okay. Taking it up a little bit. I am trying to find the antiderivative from zero to pi over three of sine of two x dx. If you recall, when it came to these, these were those special linear factor ones that you need to remember. What's the antiderivative of sine two x? Oh, I could, but boy, I really don't want to do it right now. <laughs> I got a use substitution one going, but. We can do it. Let's let's do use substitution. I mean, we, we got to incorporate it in here somewhere. All right, what am I going to make you? 2x, which means that du is going to equal 2 dx. But if you notice, there is no 2 there. So that means I need to divide both sides by 2. And what I'm really substituting in is a 1 half du. Inside of that expression. That one Dividing both sides by two. Because remember, whenever you do the um, u substitution and you do the derivative part of u substitution, you want to make sure that that derivative is exactly what remains. So anytime there's anything extra, you want to divide it or multiply it or alter it to get rid of it. So now that means I am plugging in a one half du for dx. And instead of two x, I'm going to plug in a u. Now, there's one difference that, that you can take into account, especially when bounds are involved. Those bounds are with respect to what? X, but in this case, Well, actually, the red bounds, the zero and the power of three, are with respect to x. So if you wanted to to do u substitution without having to convert it, like plug the u back in and then evaluate with the bounds, you could actually change the bounds when you do u substitution. Because right now, again, the bounds that are in red are with respect to x. But once I use u substitution, I can change the bounds and make them with respect to u. And how do I do that? Well, I just take the bounds and I plug them in for x to get my new bounds with respect to u. Oh. So when I plug in 0, 0 times 2 is? Yeah. So my new lower bound is 0 still. But my new upper bound is going to be 2 pi over 3. And I'll get the same answer by doing it this way and evaluating with the new bounds that I would if I were to take the antiderivative, replace that u, replace the 2x back, and then evaluate with the normal bounds. I get the same answer. Mm. But this, I get, if anything, it maybe saves me one step. Um, what's the antiderivative of 1 half sine u? Well, what's the antiderivative of sine? Is it negative or negative? Is it negative positive? It's, it's if you're positive. doing the antiderivative, it's negative. Yeah. It's positive. I just positive. Well, so the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. So I'm going to pull out that 1 half. So it'll be a negative 1 half cosine u. Now I can evaluate it with these new bounds instead of having to substitute 2x back in and using the old bounds. So this becomes negative 1 half cosine of 2 pi over 3 minus negative 1 half cosine of zero. What's the cosine of two pi over three? Negative one half. So this becomes negative one half times negative one half. 
then plus what's cosine of zero? One. one. So this becomes one fourth plus one half, which is nothing but three fourths. So then that'll be the area underneath the curve from zero to pi over three of sine two X. We altered the bounds. So then that way we wouldn't have to worry about plugging the U back in, but you can, and you'll get the same result. What would be the linear, like what, are you trying to guess what the linear was? Wait, can you change bounds so? Change bounds so then I wouldn't have to worry about having to plug the U back in, the two X back in for you. You can, of course, then you wouldn't have to worry about changing the bounds. And the, and the rule was that you can use your substitution to get the same thing. Yeah. Right. Let's look at this one. It says if g of two is equal to four and g of three is equal to five, not five M, sorry. I think I was trying to type the comma and that's what came up. Okay, calculate the integral from two to three of g prime of x minus one dx. Mm. It's not that bad. Just apply the, what's the anti derivative of g prime of x? G of X. So it's going to become G of X. And then what's the antiderivative of one? So it's going to be minus X. I'm going to evaluate it from two to three. Which bound goes in first? Three. So this becomes G of three minus three, three. minus, now I'm going to plug in my lower bound, G of two minus two. And I was told that g of three is equal to five. So it becomes five minus three. And I'm told that g of two is equal to four. So it becomes four minus two. So that just equals two minus two, which is? Look at that. What does that mean? <laughs> then that means that the area uh, for whatever the G function is for this respective cases, it's going to be equal to Can that happen? zero. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. What kind of, if I was a straight line. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Whew. Let's keep it going. Oh. All right. That's an interesting problem. Yeah, these are interesting problems, but this is where uh, u substitution would have came into play here. Okay, so all right, here we go. So the integral from two to three of x over x squared minus one. You would need to recognize that oh, I can't just do this using regular power rule and other rules and stuff like that. I got to use u substitution. Where you will make u what? X squared minus one. And then that means that du would equal 2x dx. But that's just a regular x up there. Huh? Divide by two. So that'd be one half du that's going to replace x dx. Do you want to change the bounds or you just want to do the substitution, do the antiderivative and plug X back in, keep the bounds the same? Change the bounds. Change the bounds. So if I change the bounds, I plug that into the U right here. So I plug two in for X and I plug three in for X. So what's my new lower bound? It's my new upper bound. No, wait, sorry. Eight. So then that becomes the integral from three to eight of one half one over u du. 
And of course, we know that one half can go on the outside. What's the antiderivative of one over u? Ln of u. What did we have to remember whenever we did ln? The absolute value signs. Okay. Now I'm going to evaluate that from the new bounds, eight to three. So that's going to become one half ln the absolute value of eight minus one half the ln the absolute value of three. Can I do anything to those? Can't you do? Isn't it like it's all the division or something? Yeah, but I can't apply that when there's this coefficient in front. Can't you just figure out the coefficient in front? You can factor it out. Can factor it out, and then what happens? Subtraction means division. division. So this becomes one half ln eight over three. And that's your final answer. No. So one half ln eight over three. You guys try this one on your own. All right, so just to recap, the fundamental theorem of calculus is the most exact way for us to find the area underneath the curve. Remember, we do that by taking the antiderivative of the function, plugging in the upper bound, subtracting from when I plug in the lower bound. You can also use geometric shapes underneath the curves that form triangles, trapezoids, squares, rectangles, circles, as well to find area underneath the curve as we did at the very beginning. You can also hold up, hold up on the packing up, y'all. Hold up on the packing up. You can also find these different rules for um, integrals or functions that you're actually not given, like you're not actually given full functions, okay? So don't forget about those. Don't forget about all the other rules. Don't forget about integration by parts, use substitution, all the different methods that we did when it came to find the antiderivative of different functions that we did before break, okay? So you're gonna need all of those when you're incorporating bounds, okay? Any questions?